Welcome back to the Coffee and Bible Time podcast. For those that may be listening for the first time, our podcast is an offshoot from our main platform, YouTube. Our channel is called Coffee and Bible Time, where our goal is to help people delight in God's word. We also have a website and storefront with Bible studies, prayer journals, and more. I'm Mentor Mama, and today Christy Wright is joining me to explore the topic, Getting Back to Yourself. Have you ever felt like there's something missing in your life or there's something that you just can't explain but are thirsting for? Well, get ready because today in this podcast, you will learn four things you need to understand to get back to who God created you to be, the best and truest version of yourselves. I am so excited. Our guest today, Christy Wright, is a number one national best selling author, personal development expert, and host of the Christy Wright Show. She's been featured on the Today Show and Fox News and in Entrepreneur and Women's Day magazines. Since 2009, Christy has served at Ramsey Solutions, love Dave, by the way, <laughs> where she teaches on personal development, business, and faith. You can follow Christy on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, or online at ChristyWright.com. Welcome, Christy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited about this. Oh, I'm so glad you could join us. So Christy, you recently released a new devotional book that's absolutely beautiful, by the way. Thank you. Called Living True, 40 Days to Get Back to You. Tell us what life events led you to being drawn to write this book. Well, it's honestly the words that I have used in describing how I felt about myself and, and different seasons of life. It's also the very same words I have heard countless women say. I can tell you, I remember um, speaking at Purdue University in 2010 when I was a brand new speaker and I was speaking on life balance. This was even before I had kids myself. And I remember talking about the importance of doing things that make you come alive and make you light up, that make you love your life this one life you've been given. And I remember this woman came up to me and she said, I want to do that, but I don't even know who I am. I feel like I've lost myself in my own life. And that was the first time I remember hearing those words, but then I have felt those words and heard those words countless times since. And I think that this sentiment that you lose yourself, that I just want to get back to me. I just want to get back to me. I don't know that we could even really necessarily define it, but it, it rings true for how we feel. And if, if there's someone listening right now, especially a lot of times men or maybe younger people listening, they might be like, oh, I've never felt that before. But if you have felt that, you're like, that's exactly how I felt. And I have felt that in jobs that were consuming where I worked 80 hours a week, in seasons of life where I felt really overwhelmed by a difficult season. And I've definitely, definitely felt that in motherhood. I'm still consider myself a very uh, mom of young kids. My oldest is six, barely turned six. So I have six, four and a half and one and a half. Oh, wow. And it's so consuming. It's so wonderful, but it's so consuming. And so from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, you are filling sippy cups and running from meetings and you're running around and you're kind of going, where am I? in all this? Where am I in my own life? And so the reason that I wanted to write this devotional specifically to answer this question from God's word, what does God say about who we are and, and how can we get back to ourselves or right? that sense of self? And what does God have to say about this? So I, I knew I wanted to tackle this subject, but I had to put together an outline for it. You know, we have a publishing house here in our company in Ramsey Solutions. And so the leader of our publishing department said, we'll put together a one page outline. What would you say? And I was like, right, right. What would I say about that topic? <laughs> and so I was sitting on a plane. This was a couple of years ago. And I was pregnant with my third child, my daughter, Mary Grace. And I opened up my laptop to a blank Microsoft Word document. And I just prayed. And I just asked God, I said, God, I want to write a devotional on this topic. It's what I feel like you, you're leading me into and get back to you. So how do we do that? What, what do we need to know 
to get back to ourselves. And I felt God give me four things and I typed them out instantly. I did not edit them or change them or rearrange them. I felt God give me these four things in order. You need to know who God is, who you are, where you are, like your season of life and where you're going. And when you know those four things, you get back to yourself. And you, and, and of course, we go through different seasons of life. But I think that as we spend in the in the devotional, we spend ten days on each of those subjects, each of those topics, as they build on each other very intentionally in that order. It gives you a sense of who you are, despite your circumstances, despite your season, despite your roles and responsibilities, and you feel more rooted in who you're created to be. Oh, thank you so much. Well. I can completely resonate with all four of those areas. And I think we're going to tackle each of those just a little bit. So the first section of your book called Who God Is says that in order to figure out who we are, we must fully understand who God is. So why is that important? And what sort of amazing discoveries that I'm guessing you had that you uncovered about God when you were researching this section. Yeah, it's interesting because I think, um, you know, I'm a big fan of the personal development world. I know a lot of Christians can feel like, oh, it, this it, self-help is anti-scripture. And I think these things actually come together beautifully. We're, we're going to work like it all depends on us and pray like it all depends on God. And you can seek God for your life and still work. Um, and, and steward what he's given you from time to talents to whatever. And so I think one of the the downsides maybe of the personal development world or self-help world is it's very introspective. It's very, let me look at me to find me. Let me look inside myself to find myself. Let me pull myself up of my bootstraps. And God's not really a part of the equation. Well, as a believer, I don't feel like, feel like you'll ever find out who you are by looking at you. I think that to, if you want to know who you are, you need to start with the one that created you. And so we start there. We start with who God is in the first 10 days of this devotional journey for two main reasons. Number one, we are created in the image of God. So if you want to know who you are, you need to know God, who you are created in the image of. You need to know him first and know him most because we are created in his image. He's also our creator. The second reason is that God knows you better than you know yourself. And so often I think, well, I know best. I know what I like, what I don't, what I'm good at, what I'm not. The reality is if we look at ourselves for the, the picture of who we are and who we are trying to get back to, it's always going to be a partial picture. It's going to be limited information because God created you. And so he knows you even better than you do. He knows what you need. He knows what you want. And he knows where you're going and he knows the plans he has for you. And so we start there with who God is. And we say, okay, I want to, I want to root myself in the knowledge of my creator, my father, the God that I'm created in the image of. And when I know him and have a more accurate picture of him, it's going to be a lot easier to have a more accurate picture of myself. And so we start there. And I think that foundation is so important in the order that we go in. But what's so interesting is every single day, it's a 40 day devotional. Every day is a different attribute of God for the first 10 days. And the attributes are really simple. They're not complex. This is not deep theology. It's not like, oh my gosh, I've got to, you know, have 17 dictionaries to figure out what we're talking about. They're very simple concepts, but very profound. And I think they're so simple. We miss them. And they're so simple, we brush them off like, oh, I've heard that before, but we don't live from them. And if we reset and refocus on the truth of who God is according to his word, what he says about himself and his word, he is faithful, he is good, he is all powerful, he is all knowing, he is on time, he is a provider, he is a father. When we remind ourselves and spend one day focusing on just one attribute, it allows that truth to sink into our spirit. And it gives us a different level of confidence about our life and even our relationship with our, our loving father. And so that's why I love that we just focus on one thing at a time, one attribute each day. And as we spend these 10 days, which I love the, I love that 40 is such a biblical number and it's not an intimidating number for devotional for busy people. Um, but it's also 10 is a, a number of completion. And so you see there's these, it's certainly not all the attributes of God, but it's 10 that I think are very important for us to understand who he is on our own journey back to who we are. Absolutely. And for those of you who haven't seen her, her book yet, 
I would just add to that, that it's filled with scripture verses that just beautifully pull out all of these points that you're trying to make. And, and that's, of course, one of our missions here is to help people delight in God's word. Yeah. And when you do that and you read those verses, they're, they're so enriching and have such, like you said, simple truths that have a profound impact. Well, the second section of the book called Who You Are explores who we are in God. And we've all noticed that the world in so many ways is constantly trying to shape our identity. So what are some examples of harmful thought patterns regarding our identity and what are healthy sources of our identity? Yeah, it's interesting because our sense of ourself is shaped from so many different things. Like you said, it's shaped from childhood wounds, uh, childhood experiences that forever shaped who we are, um, even in our adult bodies, our adult mind. Um, you obviously have media, three to 5,000 media messages a day. Um, you have social media. That's just, that's just mainstream media. You have social media in comparison and influencers and people. And all around you, you just have all these competing voices telling you who you are and or who you should be. And if we're not careful, when we combine all these outside sources of, well, well, she looks like this, and this is what she says good parenting is, and this is what he says I should be doing with my career, and this is what this person, if, if we're not grounded in who we are according to God's definition, then we will run really hard to create a life we don't even like. We will work really hard for a life that is not even the life that God has for us. And, and we're exhausted. We're exhausted trying to keep, to, to chase this moving target, a finish line that always moves, chasing everyone else's version of success and never quite getting there because it's the, this elusive thing that always evades us. And, and we're exhausted and we're missing out on the beauty that God has for us in who he created us to be. And so that's the reason that in the second section of the book, the second set of 10 days, every day again, we focus on a different attribute of who you are according to what God says about you. Now, let's just go ahead and pick out one of those days as an example that will rock your world if you actually spend time with this idea. One of the days, as an example, is you were created with an amazing body. Well, just let that sit there for a minute because 91% of the women, 91% of American women do not like their bodies. 91%. Now, this is not one of those things where I'm like, I'm just going to give you some feel good motivation where all of a sudden you can flip a switch and love your stretch marks. That's not reality. I understand there are things that we don't like about this home that we have, but if we could go back to scripture and see what God says about this home that we have, the only home that we have on this earth, then it's going to help combat those negative thoughts. It's gonna help us have a deeper level of appreciation for his creation. It says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. When we begin to see ourselves how God sees us, it changes everything. Because in our sin nature and just at the whim of every person telling us who we are and who we should be and what we should look like and what we should think and what we should do and how we should parent, we're going to be really sad because we're never going to meet up to these standards that are not even realistic or desirable. But if we can go back to scripture and say, God, what do you say about me? You say that I am chosen. I am created. I am lovely. You delight over me with singing. How differently would I live my life and even go about my day if I lived as a person that is loved? If I lived as a person that is chosen and accepted and created? If I lived as a person that is that is given infinite grace, well, I'd probably have a lot more grace for others and forgiveness for others. I'd have a lot more confidence. I'd have a lot more comfort. I'd have a lot more faith. I'd be more comfortable in my own skin. I would enjoy my life, my mind, my family, my home, my body. I would enjoy everything more if I looked at my life through the lens of how God sees me and what he says about me. But let me tell you, with three to 5,000 media messages a day and childhood wounds that we all have in some way, shape or form. Someone called you fat. Someone wouldn't sit with you at the lunchroom, whatever those things are. And the ongoing comparison on social media and mommy wars and perfectionist standards that none of us, it's going to take a lot of rooting in God's word to combat that. It's not going to be a one-time thing. You can't go through this devotional one time and think all of a sudden 
you're never going to have to remind yourself of that because you have to put on the armor of God. You have got to root yourself in his word to combat the lies, the pressure, the misleading misinformation of the world that tells you who you are and they're wrong. The only person that knows you and has a right to say anything about you is your father that loves you and your creator. And my goal for this second, second section is to point you back to him and say, look at what he says about you. Don't believe me. You don't believe me. If it's from me, it's a surface level of compliments. Like, oh, this girl doesn't even know. Me. No, no, no. This has nothing to do with Christy, right? This is, I want to point you to what your God says about you. And that, that is life-changing. That's where the power is. That's where the transformation happens is when you root yourself in what God says about you. Amen. <laughs> I completely agree. And in the second session, uh, when I started it, I think your message is so impactful to those people that didn't come from, let's say, a standard married married family. One, mm -hmm. you know, a mom and dad married, and you came out. <laughs> right. Yeah. For me, for example, I I was given up for adoption. Wow. And those types of things can cause you to wonder, well, did God really want me? Right. Or, you know, and right. this is so important for those, for anyone who questions um, their role, that God knit you together in his yes. womb, in your mother's womb. And it's, it's absolutely healing, yeah. transformative when you can uh, submerse yourself in God's word on that topic. Yeah. So, you. okay, moving on to the third part of the book, which is called Where You Are. We know that life is just made up of all kinds of seasons, some crazier than others. Um, but we are not the season we are in. So why is it important to distinguish where you are in life from who you are? Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like I've been on this kick lately with seasons, like the last few years. It's something I don't feel like we talk about enough and we don't consider enough. And what happens is if we're not careful, and I have done this so many times, if we're not careful, we will look around ourselves at uh, for examples and clues about the season that we're in. And we will draw statements about our identity from that. So let me give you an example. I use this example in the book. I have three little kids, age six and under, they make a mess all the time. It doesn't matter how much I clean. There are goldfish everywhere. They're smearing peanut butter somewhere. They've gotten a whole new basket of toys out that I swear I just put away. Like it, it's an ongoing battle. And I'm not even like a clean freak. I'm just trying to walk. Like I'm just trying to get a path for myself and they're everywhere. If I'm not careful, I come home from work or I finally finish up dinner and everything is a mess. And I look around myself and I see that my house is a mess. And I think, I am a mess. My house is a mess. I am a mess. I can't get it together. I'm a bad mom. It, you know, what a, a, a fill in the blank. You draw statements about yourself and in your sense of identity from your season. And that's dangerous and untrue. Your season is where you are. It's not who you are. I remember in my 20s, and there may be people listening right now at any age that are feeling this. And I remember being single and feeling very forgotten, feeling like God had all my friends were married. I was a bridesmaid 497 times. No, I didn't wear the dress again. Like I was like every God has a husband for everyone, but me, like he's forgotten me. He's actually, he's busy healing cancer. He forgot about my husband. And I remember feeling like I was going to be single forever. Now this is not a marriage single statement, but if we're not careful, you look at your season and a season could be a couple months. A season could be a decade. You could go through a hard decade. But the reality is, regardless of how long the time frame is, your season is where you are. It's not who you are. It's not your source of identity. So your marital status, your children, age of children, whether you have children or not, whether they're adopted, biological, whether you're an empty nester, your career, maybe you were a, a career woman for years and now you're a stay-at-home mom and you're having an identity crisis of who am I outside of my, my corporate roles, or maybe you um, are starting a side business or starting a small business. I love to help women do that. And you're going, I'm not a business person. I don't know. I'm just a mom. I don't know how to do this. Again and again and again, we look around ourselves and we draw conclusions about who we are. And I just wanna remind people, you are in a season of fill in the blank. 
that is not who you are. You're in a season of struggling financially. You're in a season of singleness. You're in a season of little kids that make a mess. You're in a season of uh, figuring out what you want to do with your life. You're in a career change, whatever it is, you're in a season of a health crisis and you're just trying to survive and hang on with a prayer and a hope and doing everything you can. I don't know what that season is for you, but I want you to know it's a season. It's not who you are. You're not a failure. You're not single. You're not hopeless. You're not unemployed. These are not who you are. It's where you are. You're in a season of unemployment. You're in a season of single. Cool. That it's, it's where you are. It's not who you are. And I think as we walk through where you are and we understand that this where you are is a snapshot in the bigger picture of the story God is writing, then we can not only have an appreciation for this season, but we can have the strength to get through it. And so I walk through this, this um, third section is structured a little differently. And I walk through the kind of the different categories of your life that we gauge how we're doing. So your season of family, your season of love, your season of uh, uh, money, your season of your home, <laughs> mine is a mess as an example, your season <laughs> of priorities, your season of commitments. And we walk through these different things that we and women a lot of times look at to see like, how am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing with money? How am I doing? How are my kids doing? How my, how's my marriage? How, how am I doing? And when we begin to zoom out and say, hey, whatever your season is in this particular category, good or bad, great. It's still just a season in the bigger picture of the story God is writing. And it's where you are. It's not who you are. So whether you are struggling like you never have, or you are incredibly successful like you never have been, it's still where you are. It's still not who you are. Oh, that's so awesome. You know, it's funny is um, my two daughters are in college and they, whenever they come home, they still make messes. <laughs> so it's just different kinds, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, what really is of interest to me in that section is I think that for those of you who will do this devotional, you can really absorb this section and the content and use it to encourage someone else. Because mm. I was just having a, a conversation with my husband and this section in your book came up to my mind, like to be able to say, you know what, don't worry. This is just a season. That's right. And so I, I love that you can use this material to help others as well. So the last section of the book called Where You're Going, you talk about cultivating confidence in the God who created you and the future he has for you. So why is this important and how has this impacted your own hope and confidence? Yeah, I think that as adults, you know, we talked about um, childhood wounds, but life can be hard. You do go through life, you know, through hard seasons. If you're an adult, you've gone through hard seasons and you've had people be mean to you, or you've had your heart broken, or you've been disappointed. You didn't get that job. And it's not always hard, hopefully, but you've probably gone through hard things. And the, the reality is, and this is even just the psychology of how our brain works, but your natural survival mechanism is when something hurts, you try to protect yourself from that again. Uh, this is a silly example, but I remember um, one of the very first, I guess it was in the first year, I was a professional speaker and I had a speaking event where I just totally bombed. I mean, just totally bombed. It was every speaker's worst nightmare and I wanted to disappear behind the podium. Oh. I cried the whole way home of how embarrassed I was and how bad it went. And I told myself the whole way home, never again. I will never speak again. I will never walk on a stage again. I'm never going to put, because that's your defense mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. If someone hurts you, I'm never going to open my heart again, or I'm never going to put myself out there again. Whatever it is, when you're hurt, you want to guard and protect. And thankfully, I didn't listen to that voice, and I've been a professional speaker for 10 years. But the reality is, I think that sometimes these wounds and heartbreaks lead us to um, these statements that we make as grownups, even if you're a believer, and they're all under the banner of being a practical grownup. So we think, say things like, I'll believe it when I see it, or I just don't want to get my hopes up, or um, I just got to guard my heart. I just, you know, I just got to guard my heart. And all these statements that we say and believe and live by, we think we're being practical and level-headed and common sense and logical and uh, responsible. All those words sound nice. None of them are in scripture. 
There's, there's not a single verse that where God says, would you please be more practical? I'm just asking you to be a little more logical. Would you please guard your heart? And I just want you to keep your hopes down. Could you get your hopes? Could you rein in your hopes? Your, your, your hope is too big. Your faith is too big. You're too hope filled. You're too faith filled. Um, just need you. I, just believe it when you see it. Really, you don't need to believe it before then. If you just you just wait till you get, no again and again and again and again in scripture, it's the exact opposite. Uh, we all know doubting Thomas. He's like, when I see the holes in his hands, I'll believe. And Jesus shows him in such humility. Here are the scars, and he says, "Blessed are those that believed and have not seen. You believed because you saw. Blessed are those." that believe though they have not seen. And I want to be the disciple. I want to be the person that doesn't have to see the nail holes. I want to be the disciple that has faith, a childlike faith that doesn't question. My kids don't question things. I mean, they question like, you know, annoying stuff. But if I tell them that something happened, even if it makes no sense, they're like, okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, they don't, they, there's this childlike faith. And it says again in scripture, that unless you have faith like a child, and sometimes we just try to be such grown-ups that we think, well, I don't want to get my hopes up and I got to guard my heart and I don't want to be disappointed and I'll believe it when I see it. And what we're really doing is that we're talking ourselves out of faith. That's what we're doing. We're trying to justify faith. We're trying to justify not having faith, rather, is what I mean. We're trying to talk ourselves out of the one thing God asks of us. In scripture, I can't remember which scripture it is. I need to memorize this one because I've quoted it a lot recently. But there's a, an example in the, one of the gospels and someone is asking Jesus, what's our job? Like, what do we need to do? And his answer essentially is believe in the one that he sent. Believe. That's it. And so when I think we think about our future, instead of guarding our heart and being practical and logical and not getting our hopes up, I think we have to have the exact opposite approach. I think we need to get our hopes way up. I think we need to have a big, bold faith that God is who he says he is. He can do what he says he can do. And our future with him is good. Why? Because he says it is. Does it mean we're going to get every job we want? No. Does it mean our heart won't get broken? No, of course not. But we can have hope because our hope is not in our circumstances anyway. Our hope is in the God of hope. And he says, therefore, I am the God of hope in Romans. Get your hopes up because your hopes are in him. And you have every reason to have a big, bold faith in who he is and what he says about you and his future for you. And again and again in scripture, it says, my future for you is good. My plans for you are good to give you hope and a future not to harm you, to prosper you. And you know, because you in his word, you know, you can build your life on it. And so I think the whole fourth section is all now that you know who God is, who you are and where you are. It's time to get a big, bold faith in where you're going because God says so. Absolutely. Uh, what that reminds me of a, a quote that's always stuck with me by Beth Moore, where she said, pray so big that you can God could only have been the one to provide the answer. Right, right, right. So, you know, we have not because we ask not. And so right. prayer is just such a, a huge component and ties so beautifully into our future hope. And, oh, Christy, it's been just uh, such a joy to talk about these sections. Um, before you go, though, what words of encouragement or advice do you have for our listeners to begin their own journeys to living true? Yeah, I would just say, I'll just, I always try to go with what first pops in my mind and trust that God has a word for someone. But um, I will say that um, one of the things I talk about in the second section of the book on you were created with a powerful mind, research shows, and this is from Jenny Allen's book, um, Get Out of Your Head, that we have up to 60,000 thoughts a day. On average, the average person has 30,000 thoughts a day and about 80% of those are negative. And so as we're wrapping up, I just want to encourage people if you're having negative thoughts, and I don't even mean like dangerous thoughts, I just mean like if you're just down on yourself, if you have the internal critic, the inner critic that is beating you up and, and tearing you down and just making you feel guilty and, and accusing you and, and voices of shame, I just want you to know that those voices are not from God because that's not how he talks to you. And so I'll leave you with a, just a really simple question I ask myself when I find my thoughts spiraling and when I find that inner critic I ask myself, is this how God talks to me? Because even when I'm convicted and I need to confess of a sin or something I've done, a mistake I've made, and we all have that because the Holy Spirit is in us and will convict you, that feels and sounds very different 
then that accusing voice of you're a bad mom and they don't like you and you're never gonna get that. That inner voice that so many of us have, um, I just wanna give you that, that one question. When you feel those thoughts going, ask yourself, is this how God talks to me? And that it will answer itself every time. It will help you weed out the voices you don't need to listen to and reset and focus on your loving father and how he talks to you. Absolutely. You know, I have this little um, <laughs> Bible verse right on my computer that from God, 2 Timothy 1, 7, that says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. Mm -hmm. So our God is definitely, just like you said, has a lot of positive thoughts for us and uh, we need to focus on that. Well, Christy, um, for those that are watching on the, on the YouTube, I'm just gonna hold up her book here. It's just beautiful. Do you have any comments you wanna make just if people wanna check you out? Is there one particular platform they should go to or their, your website? Oh yeah, christywright.com. And I'd say I'm on Facebook and Instagram, but I use Instagram probably the most. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'd love to connect. It's at Christy B. Wright on Instagram. And I love hearing people's stories. I'd love to share, you know, the screenshots of people reading the book or what God's teaching them and what he's showing them. So I just, I've loved being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for thinking of me. Oh, thank you. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on our podcast. You can learn more about us and our beautiful prayer journals that will help guide and document your prayer life at coffeeandbibletime.com. Have a great day, everyone.